Welcome back to Off the Bench presented by United Dairy Farmers. You know, on Wednesday, we do what's called the big interview. And we've been extremely blessed to have, uh, you know, s- some big name guys. And-, and I think the case can be made that here in only our third week, that the two greatest players for their franchise and our franchises here in Cincinnati in both baseball and the National Football League, we had Anthony Munoz week one. And today we have Johnny Lee Bench. This guy's story and this guy's career, and we're going to talk a lot about him personally a little bit later on. But when you just look at some of the things, and look, it's been a while, right? He'll be the first to tell you and laugh about it. But you go back when he was called up to the big leagues at 19 years young. His first full year in the big leagues in 68, he wins a rookie of the year. He wins a gold glove. He was the first catcher to ever win the rookie of the year, first catcher to ever win a gold glove, as a rookie. Two years later, becomes the youngest player ever to win the National League's Most Valuable Player Award. Led the Reds to the World Series, 45 home runs, knocked in nearly 150 runs. He wins another MVP in 72. We talked about that home run with my dad a moment ago against Dave Justy in Game 5 of the LCS. Dramatic home run that tied the game. We know about the Big Red Machine, back-to-back World Series. Johnny Bench won 10 gold gloves. 10. Was an All-Star 14 times. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He has won the Hutch Award. Went into the Hall of Fame in 1989. And we are so fortunate to have with us today on the big interview... The pride of Bangor, <laughs> Oklahoma, Johnny Lee Bench. Look at you Johnny down Lee, there, man. Johnny Lee's here, and you've already – where is it? Where do you get off using off the bench? Well, because I'm trying to get my career off the bench. <laughs> put me sense? in, coach. That'll put me in, coach, yeah. Hey, man, you never sat You're looking the bench. Good. You're looking good. But you good. know what? You are always tight with those guys uh, that were on the bench. You got to be you. You got to be tight with everybody, whether they were guys in the bullpen, guys that weren't playing every day. Yeah, you were really close to, to Joe Morgan and all those guys. But the one thing I noticed about you, Johnny, is is that you always you were always putting stock in what those guys saw or said on the bench. Is that a fa- if that, is that a fair comment? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I'm just, you know, I'm a kid from Oklahoma. I grew up in a town of 600 people. I mean, those kids were just, those guys, I say kids, those guys were just the same as I were. They were, they were on equal footing. I mean, whether it be, uh, you know, D- Doug Flynn, whether it be Tom Hume, whether it be, uh, you know, whoever it was, it really didn't, didn't matter. They're all special and they were really needed. I mean, we had to have them to win. And that's why a lot of times choices were made. Sparky would call us in, Pete, Joe, Tony, myself, or he'd call us in individually and say, hey, does this guy fit? Does this guy fit? And it was important that we all came together. And, uh, you know, today I still stay in touch. I love each one of them. Uh, they were special people and they helped make my life and my career. It made, made going to the park so much easier. And I, I certainly wasn't better than they were. I want to go back to you growing up and you talked about growing up in a small town in Oklahoma. What, what was life like in the bench family day in and day out? Well, uh, six years old, I started pulling cotton, uh, chopping cotton, hoeing peanuts. Um, then, uh, then it, as I progressed, I, I started mowing yards. I had the paper route. We'd go to the ballpark, play home run derby in the backyard over Dean Cranes. We'd play tin can. We had an old mill knot can. It was about, you know, a mill knot can is, and you'd open it with a church key and you could take a bat and you'd slice it in half and you could hit the can. And it would go a certain distance. If it went a certain distance, it was a single. And a little farther, double, triple home run. If you hit it inside the shed, it was a grand slam home run. So, <laughs> uh, you know, by the time you hit that can a few times, that's where I think I got to really learning how to hit because we were throwing sliders and curveballs and screwballs even before those things were invented. And so we were having to do it. And the great thing was my brothers and I were five and uh, brothers were five and six years older than I was, but they let me play. And, uh, you know, when I was four years old, my mouths didn't get a little better as I went along. And then, of course, uh, we started school the 1st of August, and then we would let out for about three weeks so we could harvest the crops. So we were out pulling cotton, combining peanuts, baling hay, 
And then it was a uh, little fall baseball. Then it was uh, basketball. And then it was uh, back to baseball in the spring. We just down at the ballpark playing home run derby and, and uh, hitting, I was hitting every rock out of the driveway. Dad had to, to put the gravel in twice because I hit all the rocks out of the driveway. And I nailed a coffee can to the garage or to the shed. And I would pitch and hit that can, and I would throw balls against the propane tank. I would feel it was just a great life. I I chased after it. I pursued my dream. And, you know, Tommy, at six years old, Dad started the team. We rode around the back of the pickup truck with our little Levi's and T-shirts. And we would lose. We lost, you know, especially our first few games because nobody played. It was the first time they'd had a team. And my dad would say, that's tomorrow. Let's go get a cheeseburger. And we kept practicing and home run derby and playing tin can. And at the end of the year, we beat a team that was undefeated. And we beat them. And they were over there crying. Today, it's the parents that are over there crying. <laughs> and I looked at my dad and I said, what's wrong with them? He said, they haven't learned to lose yet to get a cheeseburger. So that was life. That was, uh, you know, at 15 years old, I started playing American Legion baseball with the 18-year-olds. And it was 20 miles away. And I uh, didn't have a license, but I drove the car on the back roads, got down. And, of course, I sat on the pine because they already had three. And one of the great moments of my my American Legion career was uh, Leonard, uh, no, Jim Burgess uh, quit because he got mad at the coach. Gentry Castleman got a foul ball, broke his collarbone. Leonard Pig had three pass balls, and they put me in. And we were playing against a team from Oklahoma City, which featured a shortstop by the name of Bobby Mercer. Wow. And I hit, a home, I hit a home run that won the game. And then Jim Burgess decided he wanted to play again, so I was back on the pine. So, <laughs> Well, you weren't on the pine ball. long, Johnny. You weren't on the pine long because, I mean, what, what a year, year and a half later, uh, you're drafted, what, I think it was 26th overall by the Cincinnati Reds. You know, but, but before I ask you that, I, because a lot of young people who watch this show, and it's nobody's fault, it was just a different world we lived in. And uh, there, there weren't games to watch every single night uh, if you wanted to have MLB TV or whatever it might be. How, were you paying attention to baseball, Major League Baseball, at all growing up as a kid in Oklahoma? Well, we had the game of the week, you know, and, of course, my team was the Yankees because of Mickey Mantle. But, yeah, we'd go down and uh, down to Helms Grocery get a half gallon of ice cream, come back, fill our bowls, and we'd watch that game on the on the TV. And, you know, we got to see it once, you know, obviously once a week, maybe not even that often if we had games. So, you know, we didn't have travel ball. And, I, you know, today I don't know that I would even had a chance. There's a lot of high school teams down here in this area that won't even allow you to go out for the team unless you play. So unless you go to camp or unless you go to the instructor, you got your own own teacher, you got, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like my like people say, well, you know, my son has a catching coach. Uh, catching coach, okay. Um, okay, so you squat down the way you can, and then you catch every ball and throw it long distances on, line, you know, on a line. And that's about as simple as it is. But the best story of all was the Reds had no idea who I was. The Chicago Cubs scout, uh, a guy named Billy Capps, was in love with me and uh he brought the supervisor down i'd been on a uh we're going on the senior class trip and i hadn't played in like 10 days or two weeks and i played and i was one for four and bit with well billy brought down a supervisor to watch me play and he said uh, hey they got a game tomorrow night come back and watch he said no i gotta scout some other guys and so the next night i guess went four for four with a couple of doubles and a couple of home runs but they never saw it. And there were winter meetings, and a guy by the name of Jim uh, McLaughlin was the minor league coordinator for the Reds. They're all sitting around because nobody knew. It was the first draft. Nobody knew what to do, how to do it. And they're sitting around, and they're, you know, they're spitting out names. And they, they said, ask Jim, so what do you think of this kid bench? Ah, we're not that high on him, he said. And he walked out the door and said, who are they talking about? Who's bench? Never heard of him. And they sent in a scout from Kansas and a scout in from Texas Tony Rovella from Texas, Bob Thurman from Kansas, and they watched me play two games like the way I threw, through, and they drafted me in the second round. And Billy Capps hated that day forever. And uh, so I became a Red, 17 years old, get on a plane, fly to Tampa, Florida, get off the plane, go to the ballpark, 
warm up, get dress out, warm up the pitcher in the bullpen on the seventh, warm up the pitcher at home plate in the eighth. I caught the ninth inning of that ball game, and the other catcher was. It, you know, it's really unbelievable when, when when you start putting it that specific. And your memory of things, by the way, is just you're you're not eighty yet, right? What are you seventy? What? <laughs> Where, Where are you? Where, where's your staff? Who's your best pet? I know, but I can go. All right, okay. So, but I'm saying, I your, your memory of this stuff is amazing. I turned seventy five in December. In fact, last year I asked this lady when I turned seventy four, "Do I look seventy four? She said, "No, but you used to." <laughs> I'd like to have that lady around. We need some of her on this program. You know, is it is the story true that when Ted Williams first saw you play in some form or fashion that he said you were going to be a Hall of Famer one day? Is that an accurate story? Close. It's close. I was in spring training. We were going to do a spring training again, a game against the Senators, and Roy Seavers was uh, on our team. was very close to Ted. And – uh so I, uh, I asked if you think he'd sign a baseball for me. And he said, well, let's, I'll take you over to the clubhouse. So we walk over and Ted's sitting there and, and said, uh, uh, Ted, this is Johnny Bench and he'd like to get a ball signed by you. And he said, I'd be happy. So he wrote on the ball and I walked out. I thanked him. I walked out of the uh, clubhouse and uh, looked at the ball and said to Johnny Bench, a sure Hall of Famer, Ted Williams, or a Hall wow. of Famer for sure. You still have that ball? Ted Williams. Ted Williams, 69. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's it's, tall that's, praise coming from that guy. I mean, I, yeah. you know, we talked yeah, about him imagine? the other day. And of course, you had to live up to all of that stuff. And it wasn't like you weren't trying to anyway every day that you went out there. But, but you lived up to a Johnny in a hurry because the next season, uh, 68, it's your first full year in the big leagues. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago, you win the National League Rookie of the Year, first catcher to ever do it. Uh, You also win a gold glove. And you were 20 years old. Uh, It's a stupid question to ask you, you know, how do you describe such a thing? But, I mean, heck, my my daughter is a sophomore in college, and she's going to be 20 in a year from now. And here you were at 20 doing all those things I just said. It's mind-boggling. It is. It really is. I mean, I, yeah, I, I just, I don't believe a lot of the stuff that I mean, when I look back, I, did I really do all that? You know, I've got a boy 16 now and, and, and you know, I'm thinking next year I'm here, I hear he would be going off to play professional baseball, making $500 a month. And you know, that year in 1968, I came up at the end of 67 and uh, finished the year catching every day. In fact, only a foul tip, which broke my thumb, split my thumb wide open is you don't have to be a rookie the next year. I was in the lineup. I only needed a couple of bats to disqualify myself. And a foul ball split my thumb. So uh, <clears throat> I go to spring training. I think, you know, it, there's a good chance I'm going to be the starting catcher. But Don Pavletic had an unbelievable spring. And he started the season. And in the fifth game, he pulled a hamstring. I went into the game. I caught 154 out of 158 games. And I oh. caught 54 days in a row without a day off and I was the last one to get off the plane. I'd been in a car wreck when I was 18, a drunk driver on the wrong side of the four lane. So I was pretty, you know, my, I'm my disc is still from this day and uh, all the things that go with it. But here I was uh, catching every day. I mean, it was, you know, it was amazing to think back and think about, you know, I remember you doing this and I was like, Oh really? Okay. (laughs) Cause I, my game, it's over. I forgot the game, and uh, moved on to the, the next night, which was uh, whoever was pitching was my number one job was to get him a win and help get the team a win. You know, one of the things I've noticed, I touched on it a, uh, earlier on here about guys on the bench, but 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 I've just been so fortunate to just be standing there and listening, whether it's at Reds Fest or your Hall of Fame induction. I had the chance to go to, and you and I were announcing the Reds games together back in. 88, 89. But, but, but I, I think it's just so fascinating to listen to the conversations you have with pitchers that you worked with. And it could have been Jim Maloney. It could have been Pedro Borbone. It could have been Gary Nolan. It could have been Jack Billingham. 
sitting there and listening to a bond that you have and had with all of those guys at 20 years old, what did it take to, to the, 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 the confidence? Is that the word? To be able to start establishing that kind of relationship with guys who had had great success already in the big leagues? I, I, Tommy, I, it was my thought getting was to try to understand each pitcher. I think there are three types of pitchers. There's the ones you introduce yourself to every night, tell them where they are, what city they're in. There's the one you have to know all their mechanics. You have to know all of their mechanics, but you want to make sure that you understand their mechanics. You sometimes just stay back, take a breather. I would walk around. I would, you know, in the holes out there just to kill some time so they could take a breath. And then there were the guys you actually went out there and chewed their butt out because you, they weren't doing what they needed to do and how what up to their level of capabilities. And then you had to figure out the best way you could get a win for them. And you had to build in their confidence. And and you had enough to do it. I mean, I, I got the name Little General when I was 20 years old, and I guess it was because I thought you were supposed to play the game one way, and that was your professional on the field. You do your job. You show up on time. You know, there's so many people say, "Well, he's great in the clubhouse." Well, okay, great. What does that mean? I don't I don't know. Are you on time? Do you not ask any specific thing for yourself? Do you not need extra special help? Do you? I want this. I want this treatment. No, I. No, we're all equal, and I wanted to do that. And and when they were there, I was I was backing them up. I, I backed them up, and they knew it. I would go to the bullpen. I would try to get the best of them. I would encourage them. Um, I just felt a responsibility, and and so um, I don't know. I never I never felt like I was I was better than any of them. I always thought I, we were on an equal ground, and that's the way I wanted to maintain that. Okay, but the bottom line is uh, you, you were better than all of them. You didn't think you were better than all of them, but in 70 and 72, you're the National League's most valuable player. Um, both of those years, your team loses in the World Series, 70 to Baltimore, 72 to Oakland. I'm guessing that Johnny Bench would have traded in both of those MVP awards for World Series rings those two years. Is that safe to say? Well, you have to remember after that 1972, after that World Series loss, I went in four days after I turned 25 and had lung surgery. They had found a spot on my lung, and they were going to have to remove it. And the operations in those days started in the center and went all the way around the back to the neck. And then they opened up you up and took out whatever part of the lung they needed to take out. Uh, so I knew at that time that you know my career could basically be over. Um, and I'm thinking, wow. I mean, when we got beat by the A's, I thought that was the most depressing part of it. We misjudged a couple of fly balls. We did some things that we should have won. And that was that was it. But the burden was on me to do that. I hit the home run in the playoffs against the Pirates to, to tie it up. And then we won it in the ninth, which was still to my, this day. I could, even when we went back into Riverfront, I could hear, still hear the, the echoes arborating off of the the stands about that particular game. But I didn't know that I would ever play again. I mean, that was sort of the thing. And then a, uh, a doctor there in Cincinnati named Lou Gonzalez wanted to try a special technique. And I became the first staple surgery in America. And uh, I never had, you know, I never had the years again. I never reached that pinnacle because you start cutting bone and ribs and nerves and everything else. And then, you know, I like to say that baseball is a game of this. Now, I could hit the ball out front. Now I could hit the ball here. So the reaction time changed. And he was the same player. Uh, had decent years. But, you know, when they cut you wide open and do that. So, you know, I'm like, well, my, I, my career was great, I guess. But it could have been great. Greater, I suppose. So, um, enough for him to have have Lou um, uh, be so specialized and so innovative that he was able to do that, that I was able to come back and play, come to spring training. And then, you know, you know, I hit 30 home runs or 30 some home runs, I guess, and drove in a hundred a couple of times more. But I, I, I guess it's never, you know, the never the same and never the same level. And, uh, but it was all made up when 75, when we 
when we beat the Red Sox and then to come back the next year and win and win against the Yankees. The easy thing for a lot of people to say is the 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 guy that got the Reds over the hump from losing World Series in 70 and 72 was Joe Morgan. Not necessarily Definitely. everybody agrees with that statement because uh, he does come over um, and, you know, 73, you get beat in the league championship series by the Mets. 74, don't make the playoffs at all. Uh, there was no wild card back then or the Reds would have been in there. Dodgers just had a good club. It is what it is. But it, it, you agree with that statement or is, there just, or is there more to it than just that statement? Oh, there's a couple of other people more to that. I mean, Joe Morgan was as good as ever ever walked on the field. Let's just get that out of the way. He could win a game in so many ways. But there was a guy named Jack Billingham who won 19 games two years in a row. And there was a center fielder that could patrol out there. And it was just amazing to watch Cesar play every day. And uh, I thought, you know, no matter what, I'll, I'll give all the credit to Joe, but I'm going to never walk away from the fact that Cesar Geronimo and... and Jack Billy weren't unbelievable integral parts. If you can imagine being having a stalwart like Jack go out on the mound, win 19 games, and bolster that staff and pitch long into games and go deep, and it was just a very special. He was a special guy, and one of those guys that you just loved from the very beginning. He would come in after they got after we got out of the first inning. He'd walk in. We haven't scored yet. Come on, you know. It would be <laughs> like you know he wouldn't be sitting in the corner doing all that stuff. Uh, they were special. Yeah, Joe, Joe, obviously, Joe made, you know, we were able to move, you know, then when that trade, because Tony went over to first, and then we had third base with Dennis Mankey. Then Pete came in, to, you know, and, and we then we got George, and George obviously was really the catalyst in so many ways um, to make all those things happen. But, you know, I still go everywhere, Tommy, and people say to me, I was a Cubs fan. I was a Dodgers fan, but boy, we respected you guys. Mm -hmm. And they can name the lineup they name our lineup and i think most people in america that knew baseball back in those days could name the lineup it was it was a really special to have ken griffey my gosh you know what he did and davy um i mean you know they say the big four but the great eight was as good as it ever ever walked on the field how in the world johnny is dave concepcion not in the hall of fame well my my reasoning or my people say is that because the big shortstop started coming in and hitting 40 home runs you know in in when they have a, a veterans committee and and they say we're have we overlooked anybody and I start talking about David Concepcion you know and Ozzy's sitting there at the table with me I said Ozzy if you don't come into the league Davey wins 10 gold gloves I mean I had one guy at the table say oh he was just like Larry Boa and it was like flabbergasting. I, it was. It was. I mean, when you look at the shortstop thing, but that was the time Ripken and, and Rodriguez yeah. and all those guys were coming in. They're in 40 home runs, and all of a sudden, Davey doesn't look like, well, he's not that good. He can't be that great because he didn't hit 40 home runs. And he's batting eighth. He's batting seventh. He's driving in runs. He's hitting home runs. He's stealing bases. I don't I'll compare him with, all, with how many shortstops you want in the Hall of Fame right now. I'll put him up against him right now. I, I, he's just, he was just that special. Um, in those two World Series you mentioned, 75 and 76, uh, there are these two guys, Carlton Fisk and Thurman Munson, who American League fans are saying, you know, this is the guy or these are the guys that are the next Johnny Bench. W was there any sort of competition for you personally? I mean, I know you put the team first. But when you went head-to-head -head with the Red Sox and Fisk, with the Yankees and Munson, was that a little extra kick in the tail for you in any form or fashion? No. No. Come I, on. I, Come on. It wasn't. It wasn't. My job every day was to go out there and be the same Johnny Bench no matter who and what and when and where. You know, I, my old roommate was Pat Corrales. We'd go out and take uh, infield. Come on, Bet. Come on, roommate. He was my roommate. He said, Come on, roommate. There will come out to watch you throw. And that was the job every day. That was nothing more than that. I admired those guys I, to no end. And was it a competition? I couldn't pitch against them. You know, could I try to get them out? Yes. Didn't get Munson out very much. But Fisk and his longevity and his numbers he put, I just think he's about as good a top two or three as there ever was to play the game of baseball. And, and Thurman, unfortunately, you know, with not the tools 
with now the talent that he, you know, some some were graced with to have the strongest arm or you know the home run power. He put numbers up. He learned quick release. He learned transfers. He learned all that stuff. And every time we saw each other, it was a big hug because we really admired each other. And that's that's the only thing. Believe me, was I jealous of anybody? Uh, no, no. I mean. You know, in the eighth grade, there was a book I read. If you compare yourself with others, you're going to come short a lot of the times. So why why do you compare yourself? Go out and do your job. The only person I had to compete against was that pitcher or that base runner who I just thrived on throwing out and wanted to. That was the only one. I mean, if you want to say I was against I was against somebody, I was I was against Blue Brock. I was against Morgan Wills. I was against Lopes. I was Mickey Rivers. That was the only challenge I had. Plus going up to the plate every every at bat and trying to drive in drive in the run. I'm kind of curious. It just, it just sparks this, this question by what you just said about, you know, guys getting on first base. And, and obviously you want your pitcher to get everybody out. But would there be times, and, and depending on the situation of the game, obviously, you know, a nine-run spread is very different than a tie game or a one-run spread. But were there times where you kind of hoped when you're sitting there and, and Maury Wills or Lou Brock or – uh, some of those guys with the Pirates that could run like crazy, uh, that they would come to the plate and you'd say, man, I hope this guy gets on first because I'd love the chance to see if I can throw this guy out. Well, I didn't want him on base, but if they were going on base, then that's when it all started. I remember Lou Brock the first time he came to town. And I'm a cocky kid, you know. I'm, I, you know, Luke, I'm thinking, here, well, the Cardinals are coming to town, Lou Brock. I said, and, you know, I said, I wonder if Lou's heard of me. You know, I can't believe <laughs> So he comes up and he said, how you doing, kid? And I said, maybe he has heard of me. Oh, boy, that's just good. So I'm thinking. And now I'm thinking to get to get a hit. Get on. Let's just get it on. Let's get it on. And he hits a double. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. He's getting a big lead off second. Uh-uh, maybe he hadn't heard of me. It's just next time. And he's leaning. You know, he's leaning towards third. And I think he does that again. I'll pick his ass off right now. <laughs> so I put the little pickoff play with Helms on and, the, he took that little lean, and I came up, and I threw a rocket down to second, and he went to third. Just trotted over to third. Just <laughs> and looked at me like, you dumb rookie. You dumb rookie. Oh, my gosh. You got him it, sooner it was, or later, though. I mean, you got him sooner or later. Well, he, you know, he told me at the Hall of Fame, he says, you know you threw me out three times in one game. He said, you know what I said when I came up the fourth time? And I said, knowing you, Lou, you said if I get on, I'm going again. That's exactly what I said. Now, one of the great things about Lou was Lou came into we came into St. Louis. Lou had Lou had thirty two stolen bases in a row, and we had a, we had a pitcher named Jack Fisher. We called him Fat Jack, and he had kind of a belly, so he'd he'd hold his glove like this in the stretch. Never looked like he was you know quick at all the home plate, but he came through at the home. Lou took off. I threw it down. Lou hadn't got to the cutout. Hadn't got to the cutout when the ball got there. And he stopped and just looked around at me. Now we had a we had a rule, a fifty dollars for frat night. Dave Bristol, you didn't talk to anybody on the other team, no matter what. You didn't even act like you were looking at the guy, or it was fifty dollars. So now after the game, I'm sitting in my locker, which is right next to Dave's office, and I'm putting taking off my sweats and taking off my shirt, and the, the shopping cart pulls up. So I think, okay, I'll get in there. When I start to dump it in. Here's Lou pushing the grocery cart in uniform in our locker room. Now I think this, there goes my health. There goes my salary. <laughs> and he looked down at me. He said, look, next time kid, make it look close <laughs> and strolled out. It was one of my great moments. It showed me what, what sometimes baseball and being against players and there, you know, there, there's good, a lot of good people out there. Boy, that's, that, that is a great story. I've never heard that story before. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, the Big Red Machine comes to an end. Did that have to happen? Well, it, you know, when you get to be an age back in those days, you start turning 33, 34, you know, you pretty much, you know, everybody figured that you didn't have much longer to go. And, and that's when, you know, they traded Tony, and that's when I cried and, because I knew how important he was to to us, and was changing a little bit, and and it was like, uh, but it just took the heart and soul out of us. We were, uh, 
we were Tony Perez in so many ways. He was the embodiment of all of us. And he was there no matter what. He was 0 for 4 or 4 for 4. He was the same person. He was there, you know, little rumors with Pete and Joe and start them squabbling. And we had fun and we had to do it. And so he was always the one guy, the one neutral guy that could could make everybody laugh, could everybody together, and was the competitor to no end. I mean, he, 11 years in a row, he had uh, 90 RBIs. And I, I'll brag on myself a little bit here. And in the last year, he had 10 90 RBI seasons. It was the last game of the year. And he had 89. And I was batting in front of him, and I came up the man on third and less than two outs. And I I just, I took everything I could to take. I finally got a walk. And Tony came up and drove in the 90th run. And I walk out of the clubhouse and Patuka was standing there. She said, I know what you did. I know what you did. <laughs> and that meant more to me than almost anything could mean. Because that was kind of a, that's so neat. I mean, to, and it's just what Tony was, a, an RBI machine. But, you know, 10 years, why not make it 11? Why do I? I, I could drive him in, but no, I had a guy I could drive him in, too. I could, <laughs> this pitcher was a pretty good patsy. So, But I, won't get on. I, I didn't want to drive in that run. Mm-hmm. And uh, that meant so much to me and because that's the type of person he was. So the big red machine, you know, kind of faded when Tony left, and then it was just a matter of, you know, here and there and piecemeal. And then Don Gullett went as free agent, which uh, which didn't really replace Donnie. He was about as good as a competitor as I've ever had, mm-hmm. best athlete I've ever seen. And so, yeah, we, uh, of course, we got Seaver and we made a run, and, t- you know, and then we had to strike and we won more games, but we didn't get in the playoffs. And and then we just, uh, by that time, uh, it was a cost-cutting thing, you know, uh, to try to get rid of some people and try to make a team. But they certainly weren't, you know, the the Pete Roses and the Cesar and George and all of those guys. And then, you know, Tony and, and uh, when Joe and Pete left, uh, there was, uh, I mean, how do you replace those? You can't. Yeah. It's impossible. No. Um, your last three seasons, uh, y- 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 you come off the plate, you start playing some infield and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, was that a conversation you had to have with the manager or with the organization? Did they come to you? How did that whole thing come about, Johnny, where all of a sudden, you know, one night Johnny Bench is not going to be behind the plate. He's going to be somewhere, anywhere else. Well, I caught 13, 13 consecutive years with 100 games or more behind the plate. And if you'll remember, I talked about the car wreck back when I was yep. 1966. And it was old. My ulna nerve was so bad that it was like somebody stick a knife into, into my arm every time I threw it a second. My back, I had five bad discs. I had two herniated discs in my neck at that time. Nobody knew that. I, uh, I just couldn't take the wear and tear. I mean, I, I, I knew I could play first base and I could produce. And it was, you know, it had to be time that at least I wanted to produce and get away from the rigors of catching every day. And, but I, my back was so bad. My elbow was so bad and it just, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't perform. And, and that's what got me retired was, was I, you know, Johnny Bench anymore. And there's a level of standard of level that you have to play. I walked away from my two more years of big money for back in those days. And it was, uh, but I felt like I was cheating and I was working for fifth third at the time. I was going to do the broadcasting for the Reds and it wasn't so much, I mean, obviously not nearly the money, but it wasn't that important. It was the fact that I couldn't be Johnny Bench anymore. And, uh, in fact, John Elway called me one time. He said, how do you know when to retire? And I said, when you can't be John Elway anymore. And he said, well, I got 300 pound linemen and I'm in the best shape of my life chasing me down. And I said, yeah, but you're still John Elway. And I couldn't do what Johnny Bench was supposed to do. And we were, we had no, we really didn't have a future. We were going to lose a hundred games. And that's not what, you know, was good for me or the organization. And there was just not a way to, to rationalize. I, I was 35. I wanted to be able to play golf. I wanted to be able to walk when I was 50. These other catchers that were broke down already having knee replacements and everything else that were crippled basically because of staying out there way past their due. 
and it was just a matter of making the right decision for Johnny and health and, and, and my future. One of the most incredible moments, uh, certainly in Reds history, uh, and I mean, you can talk about the World Series titles and all those things, and I get it, but the one incredible night is September the 17th of 1983. It's Johnny Bench night, huge crowd. Uh, you've already announced that you're, you're going to be retiring. And you hit your 389th career home run, your final career home run. What, what, what do you remember about that night and that moment when that ball cleared the wall? Well, that was my night, Tom. For the first time, it was all about me. I walked up. It was me. I, I, it was the team. We weren't going to win. We weren't going to do it, but it wasn't so much. It was about me. And I thought, I'm thinking, wow. And so I, I going to ask, I said, are we going to have a good crowd? And they said, yeah, we think we'll have 30 or 35. And when I walked out from that wall with 44,000 people in the largest crowd in a weekday in the history of the stadium. And it was, uh, it was sheer pleasure. It was just something that, you know what, you, you've earned this. And because you played your heart out, you you had to baseball and to Cincinnati and to the uniform and you've earned this. And, uh, everybody was sky high. Uh, Mike Madden, I sort of had read him, you know, what was, you know, his glove and everything else. And I was, so I kind of looked for, and, uh, it was an out-of-body experience after that. I can still remember the crowd. I can still remember the tears in so many people's eyes. I can still hear Joe, Mor- Joe Mor- uh, Nuxall's voice with tears in his eyes. I mean, you could hear the, hear the tears as he was announcing it. And can you believe it? And it was like, uh, it was everything. It was, it was a culmination of a really it's very satisfying career and one that I felt people came out to, to honor. And I don't think there's any greater thing. You know, I, when I talk, I talk about the fact that you cannot hold your happiness in the hands of others. You cannot wait for them to applaud just to give you validation. Every day you're out there, you have to do your job without the rewards, without somebody saying it. I've, I've hit two home runs in a game and went out after the game and I run it. I had two home runs, drove in five runs. I go out and see people and they say, hey, I saw you pop up and strike out. I mean, that's the thing that, you know, that happens in your career. You know, I mean, you're booed, you're done, you're everything else. Uh, but that was the validation of it. And it, it just meant everything in the world to me. That was the most special moment ever in my career uh, of playing the game of baseball. Uh, individually, the best thing ever was uh, walking into the clubhouse in 75 and seeing 25 players that were world champions, the coaches, the trainers, the equipment, Bernie standing there, the sponsors, the owners, and the joy that it brought to everyone. And you can never replace that. You can never understand, you know, sometimes the fan that is so fanatic that that's they're consumed by it. And you never see that or you never feel that. And how about the World Series? You really guys must love the World Series. World Series is the hardest thing to play because you had every family member needed a ticket. You had to find rooms for them. You had to travel. You had to do all the stuff and get it done. And they're out there having parades and having restaurants <laughs> and drinking and doing all the stuff. And they're having the time of their life. And we're out there figuring out a way to win four games. Uh, you're matching up against one, another great team. And that, when, when, when I saw the joy and I... You know, I can still see Alex Grammas and Sugar Bear and, uh, and Ted and Larry. And I mean, it was just, you know, and Sparky. And, and when I hit that home run in, in the fourth game at the games and Sparky said, I got one, I got to tell you one thing, Sugar Bear, we're going to be world champions again. <laughs> that, it was everything. You know, that's, that's when you realize how important things are in your life. But for one night, that was Johnny Bench night. I want to get away from, from baseball for a minute and, and, and ask you about some of the people that you had a chance to meet and spend a lot of time around that were outside of baseball. 
uh, for our generation, there aren't a ton of people, not, not, our, not you and me, but this younger generation, they don't know Bob Hope. Bob Hope was larger than life. Maybe the most well-known outside of Muhammad Ali, I think you could probably make the argument, maybe the most <laughs> well-known American, right, on the planet. You had a chance totally. to spend a lot of time with him. Went to Vietnam with him. Um, Bobby Knight, who you befriended and have stayed close with. You were there when he won a national championship running off the floor with him. You name your son Bobby Banger Bench, your oldest son. Uh, Bobby for Bob Hope and Bobby Knight and, 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 and uh, Banger, obviously, your hometown. A guy like Bobby Knight, there's no way he would be hired in this day and age. What does that say about our society today? Uh, that we have very sensitive sensitive kids who just want a participation uh, medal and that they need to be pampered and coddled and they don't want to hear their faults and uh, they've been pampered all their lives and you know Bob was uh, Bobby was just one of those guys that taught discipline taught baseball taught fundament fundamentals and demanded respect and demanded everyone to play at the same level and do everything that he wanted them to do uh, it just is part of our society because we are a woke society in so many ways. You know, we uh, wait for the handout. We wait for somebody to do it for us. Um, and so Bobby and I, you know, we've golfed, we fished. I went to the Olympic games with him, Bob Hope. I traveled for the USO trip and we talked every week. I've been to uh, Frank Sinatra's house for Christmas Eve dinner. I've been to the White House for state dinners. I've been to you know, and you could, you know, people start talking. I thought all of a sudden I said, yeah, that's right. I met Randolph Scott and then Jonathan Winters was a good friend. And then, yeah, I did, uh, I hosted Muhammad Ali's birthday party. And then I, and I guess, you know, I, I have done a lot of things. Maybe yeah, I have done things. I had my own TV show. My first guests were Bob Hope and Willie Mays. You know, I had country artists. I had, I'd emceed the uh, Oklahoma Centennial. I'm sitting on the bus with Reba McIntyre and Toby Keith and Garth Brooks and Vince Gill. And, you know, just some of the guys just hanging out from Oklahoma. Nobody's special there. I don't remember those names, Tommy. But I, uh, I've done it, you know. And, <laughs> but it's, and then I, uh, I got to be a father. Three and a half years of the boys on my own, 24-7. Just finished making waffles as we uh, go through this hurricane. Uh, waffles and uh, I'll go to the grocery store if I get a chance and get some more milk and uh, then I'm going to go fishing in Wichita Heck my dad lot. my dad was just on a little while ago and and I asked him I said you know I said if there was something that that maybe you've never heard Johnny Bench asked about uh, or maybe something that that my dad was curious about uh, what would you ask him about and, and he said to me, and, and, and I had already had this down, but, but, but I think it's, I, you know, my dad has, had made the comment, he said, look, as a player at his position, the greatest player without a doubt he's ever seen in any sport. That includes the greatest quarterback, you know, greatest uh, basketball player, point guard, whatever it might be. He said, number two, the flair for the dramatic, when it meant the most, nobody was better than Johnny Bench. He said, but the thing that I'm the most interested in and the most proud of with Johnny Bench, because you guys have known each other through thick and thin for a long time. Um, he said, I'm amazed what he's doing with, uh, with these two boys, Justin and Joshua. Um, that, 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 that you are raising these two boys and have been for a long, long time, virtually, uh, by yourself, as a 70-something-year-old father. What, what have you learned from them? Because, look, I, my, my kids, I still have a senior in high school, then it's empty nester, man. And, and I, 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 I get sad, I almost want to cry thinking about it every single day. Here you are still going strong and raising these, these boys, and you're, you know, 15 years older than I am. Um, what, what have you learned from them? that you never learned from teammates or Bob Hope or, or Muhammad Ali or, or anybody else? <laughs> this, is a, this is the way, you know, you, you grow up, you play baseball, you have a life, you have a responsibility. 
Responsibility is what you do. Uh, there's a thing I had called inner conceit. I was better than the situation. I could match up. I was better than that person out there. At some point, I wasn't better than that there, that, that pitcher. There's a responsibility that you have to have every time to the team, to that position, to your fans, to everybody you have. The responsibility is that you have to take care of these boys as best you can. And you're your, sometimes you have to be your own critic. And there's times when I want them, can I turn them loose next year after he's seen the year? Can he, can he survive? Have I done a good enough job? And I find myself falling short sometimes, the responsibility sometimes, because I probably looked after them a little too closely and let them have, you know, more of their, more their own ways. I, uh, it's, it's, it's something that no matter if you're pulling cotton, you got to do the best job. If you're combining peanuts, you got to do the best job. If you're catching, you do the best job. If you're broadcasting, you try to do the very best job. If you're going to be a father, why not be the best? You know, the, there, I, I, my, uh, my vows of success, the A, E, I, O, U's of life. The A is an attitude, and I have it every day. How you doing? I'm awesome. And you try saying that, and you find out you are awesome. E is an effort for excellence. Why not be the best? So why not be the best at everything you do, whether it be a father, whether it be baseball, or whether you played golf. I played golf professionally, so I bowled professionally. I did things professionally. I did what I did, but it's, it's, the, it's what's there at the time that you're responsible for. And you have to do it every day. Oh, it's an opportunity. It was given to me, and now I've got to do it. You is using people, using knowledge, using friends, using things that you can garner and be better at every day. To study the way we are, and we study neurovisual uh, stuff, and to be better at that. You is using those people to every chance and learn more every day. I'm just a high school graduate, and I try to learn something every day. But you is sometimes why, which means you are important. And never, never real think that you're not. And you set your goal every day to, you know, and you achieve it. And you don't wait for somebody to say, nice going, Johnny. You did a great job. No, that's you're your own critic. And when you do that, go do something for yourself. I don't care if you sit in a bubble bath. I don't care if you go fishing. I don't care what it is. But every now and then you got to tell yourself that you are good. And you've done a good job. And never be satisfied that it can't be better. And so my job every day is to be better. And to go out there and you know, you know, make sure that they're up to up to snuff as best I can, and I fall short. I do fall short, and I understand that. So I have to be better every day. Um, you know, it's funny. I I didn't get married uh, till uh, compared to most anyway, till a little bit later on in life, thirty seven, thirty eight. Didn't have our first child till I was forty, and when I started coaching, uh, both my daughter and my son. Uh, in basketball, coach my son in baseball. I was such a great baseball coach that now he's a big lacrosse star, and all the guys that played on his baseball team, they're all lacrosse players now. So I, I did a hell of a job. But Well, why, why wouldn't you? I mean, you think about it. You hit a ground ball to a kid, it hits him on the shin. You hit a pop fly, it hits him in the head. You throw a pitch to him, and he swings and misses. Or, hey, how about if we give you a uniform, put some pads on you and a mask, and give you a stick and go out and hit people and run all you want? Hey, yeah. for that. I mean, that's the biggest challenge, right, baseball's facing right now. I mean, for the kids out there and the way they're built in this day and age, and look, ultimately it's our fault for putting them in that situation in many, many ways. But, but, but Johnny, baseball, I got to tell you. Now, I live in a little area, and it's a public high school, and lacrosse has been the thing just because two guys started it 35 years ago, and you're winning state championships, and everybody wants to be a part of that. But, but I look around. I'm worried about baseball. Are you worried about it? No, we've got the Latin. We got the Latin. You know, I mean, they're 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 committed to it. They would they love it. And my gosh, why shouldn't we enjoy it? And throw. Yeah, I would like to see these kids down here, but they're, we've we've made it such a challenge. And when we get kids out there to play, and immediately they got to go to a travel team, and then they got to go. And if they're not on a travel team, they're not good enough to play. And so you never get a kid that's you know that starts out in Trump is a walk on ever gets a chance. And so you, and right away, you're already, you already know that you're, you're not going to make it. I mean, you've already told the kid, no, you can't make it because you're not good enough to be on this travel team. So you're not good enough. And so what are they going to do? They're going to go to lacrosse, go to soccer. They're going to do sports. And we love every second of it. My son's playing soccer. 
and I love the games. And he's playing tennis, and I love to watch him play. And, you know, he got hit by a pitch, got hit by a thrown pitch in the eye, and he's he got gun shy. Do mm -hmm. I want him to be that? Wish I wish I could, yeah. I wish I could put a, you know, magic and make it happen, but the drive has to be there. And so many kids just don't have it. It, I-T, they don't have it, or the desire. And uh, when they don't have it, you know, you just can't, you can't make them, you can't coach them to have it. You gotta have it, no. No, the tendency isn't. Of course, we don't let them out. You know, they got to be under supervision because we don't let them go across the street and play and have a good time and learn how to throw and learn how to hit. And No, because we can't leave them out there on the field by themselves. Uh-uh, that's too dangerous. What, 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 what's the future look like? If you had a crystal ball, Johnny, I mean, you still got the boys at home, not all that much longer. Uh, good Lord willing, they're off and, and doing their thing and, and, and going where they want to go and accomplishing the things they want to accomplish. You're still healthy. You're fit. Obviously, very sharp mind. Um, what, what do you want to do? Well, I'm out, I've got to put an ad out uh, for looking for someone in a couple of tours to come and wipe my drool and push my wheelchair. I just am, I'm, you know, I'm going to come what may. I'll you know, take that I, job. I mean, I, I, if you remember, I mean, I tell people all the time. I was at the 1989 World Series when the earthquake happened, and they're like, what the hell were you doing there? I'm like, well, look. I'm like, I'm a single guy. I'm announcing the games with Johnny Bench. He asked me, he says, hey, what are you doing in October? I said, I'm not doing anything. He said, you got any vacation time? I'm like, yeah, I got a lot of vacation time. He says, well, look, I'm announcing the World Series for CBS Radio. I need to get my wife to the ballpark every day. If I pay for you to come out there and, you know, that kind of thing and put you up in somewhere to stay, would you mind getting her to the ballpark every day? I said, are you kidding me? So if you need somebody to push your wheelchair around, brother, I'm out of a job. I'm happy to come down there to Florida. Well, there's certain qualifications you don't have, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are. Yes, very, very many of them. I get it. I get it. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go fishing and I'm going to go uh, enjoy some things and everything else and may want to travel a little bit more. I don't play golf anymore. The warranty ran out on all my parts and I, and uh, I did, my, my knees are still special and perfect and have no problems with them. And I just, you know, I don't know. I've got I've got a year and a half. To, I've, well, I I got an eighth grader. I got four or five years yeah. to responsibility, and and it's all part of it. So I'm just going to enjoy the hell out of it. I've got so many wonderful friends I've met down here. We've got groups. We're in business. We're talking about business. We're talking things. I'm still learning. You know, I'm. Uh, you know, health is uh, always a day to day thing. You never know what's going to happen to you. You come up with eight, and all of us start getting a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready for it today and I'll do the best job I can. And then, you know, tomorrow I'll be ready for that too. Are you going through this college application <laughs> thing yet? Have you hit this yet? We're, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, trying to get some ideas now. We'll start doing uh -huh. a little bit of traveling and he's not real sure. And I'm not real sure he's capable right now to survive on his own. You know how father might think right. about that, about his child and yeah. second guessing whether well, they can do it. And now my eighth grader, I may just send him away a few years early with Justin and just let him take care of him because right now he's he's going to run the company and do all the stuff. He's he's buying stuff for $4 and selling for 15 And, I, you know, he's already my entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah he's yeah. got it all figured out. But that's a, that's a job. That's a challenge I have for the next year and a half is to, is to you know, try to get it and maybe at the same time get myself prepared. I see you've closed the book on me. You've All your notes are gone. No, you know, because I think sometimes, you, you know, you sit down to do these interviews, and you've been interviewed a billion times. You know, you, you sit down there, and, 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 and you sit at home last night, and, 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 and literally, I mean, I've got, you know, pages of stuff here to ask you about. But, I, you know, you're one of the few people, and I don't say this because you're on now, I, I, I just think there's so many interesting parts to Johnny Bench that I'm not so sure, and I'm curious if you agree with this. I'm not so sure Cincinnati really ever got to know Johnny Bench. Do you think that's fair? Because I, I don't know you well, but I've just been really lucky to be around you a lot, whether it, 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 the, the couple of years we spent announcing the games, the different events that I've referred to earlier where you've been there, and I've just sat back and watched you and listened to you and people who, who are in that inner circle 
and, and are or were close to you, the Dennis Jansons, the Pat Ferries, you know, all those guys. And, and I just feel like there's a, there's a part of, of, of Cincinnatians that don't know Johnny Bench. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I mean, I mean Tommy, look, I was chasing the girls. I was getting married. I was getting divorced. I was doing stuff. And then Pete came, you know, Pete's situation came along. That was the year that they and I sort of stood up and said, well, the rules are the rules. And I became absolutely villain in Cincinnati. I mean, you know, it didn't matter who it was, every broadcaster, everybody, you know, even, you know, uh, from Bob Trumpy to Seg or whoever thought that, you know, and these guys thought that, you know, well, I was wrong because I was not backing him up. And I was like, this is the way it was. I mean, you know, Mrs. Tate in the eighth grade said, you make your own bed, you got to sleep in it. And and it was not my idea. I, well, I wasn't making the decision, being a decision being made by baseball. And it was like, but yet I said, you know, well, if you broke the rules, no, he can't be in the Hall of Fame. Well, that in itself was so for many, many years, you know, and Cincinnati's not a town that, in, you know, wraps its arms around athletes. I mean, name me, name me, go ahead and name the athletes that are still in Cincinnati. Yeah, okay, you got it, Munoz. Yeah, you got Munoz. You got a few of the football okay. players that weren't known like Munoz. How old, how old yeah. are they? How old are they? What are they doing? Yeah. How successful are they? Yeah. Are they in business? I've got George Brett in Kansas City that owns apartments and owners and everything else, and everybody's trying to help him. And I asked one of our owners to come down, not to help me, because I had my own investments. I had High Owner, and I had Ruben Katz, and I had people backing me up, and Mark Janke. And I asked him to come down to maybe talk to the other players about how to save their money, what to do, how to invest. Never saw them. You know, it's just that athletes have really never had, you know, it's business. Cincinnati's a business town. And I probably, you know, push, you know, put my arm out away from a lot of it and everything else. And, you know, my the greatest relationship, of course, was fifth third for 37 years. I was their spokesman and, you know, 29 years of record earnings, which I'm proud of because they believed in me and that and and that was the thing. But, you know, there's there's just sometimes, you know, even your dad, you know, your dad, when he was being inducted in the Hall of Fame, they'd come to me and said, Marty's going to talk about Pete. Talk to him. And it's Joe telling me. Joe, and, the, and he's the vice chairman and the chairman. And they're saying, talk to Pete. Talk to talk to Marty and tell him not to do it. So here I was telling Marty not to do it. And then just the day before, just before that morning of, they come to me again. Johnny, you have to talk to him. You have to talk to him. And I'm like, Joe, why don't you talk to him? No, you can talk to him. So I, I tell Marty. And it was, it was, that, it was one of the worst days because I ruined his day. And it, and it wasn't that I, whether he needed to talk about Pete or whatever, but it caused a split between us, which was, you know, carries, you know, which carried on. And, you know, uh, you know, Marty obviously stands alone as one of the greatest baseball at all time. And yet it was one simple thing that I was doing for somebody else to say, don't do it. You know, don't bring in something outside of what you are and what you've accomplished and you know you know your dad he's mm -hmm. he wants he wants to pontificate if he did was it going to make an effect to the baseball hall of fame and was pete going to be in because marty brenneman said he should be in no it it wasn't going to happen marty just do your do your speech about how proud you are and about all the people that gave you that right and everything else and you know it comes between us you know and, you know, I went over to see him when we were at the Field of Dreams. I made the effort to go see him. And because I cared, I cared what it was going to do to Marty. But that wasn't, you know, what happened. So there's, you know, there's always little things that trickle down from that. Sides that happen and you talk to people and people hear what you, I, they have to say about me. And because I'm this or I'm that. And so, you know, it... Uh, it's very disheartening in so many ways. You know, you're trying to do the best for what's best and you try to carry on for what's best for the Hall of Fame at that. And so, you know, to not know me, uh, that's that's all right. I got my friends. I got my number of people that I've always stayed by and I'll stay by forever. They can always rely on me. I can pick up the phone right now from here to California and I can go see my friends and be my people and 
I can walk. And one of the great things I got coming up, I don't know if you, they're going to commission a, a new battleship called the um, SS Cooperstown, USS Cooperstown, which I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be the spokesman up. So it's, I've got some things ahead of me. I've still got some things working. You'll always have things working, JB. You'll I always will. have things I'll working, man. Out. That's who you are, brother. That's who you are. You'll always have something <laughs> working. I'm a friend. I'm a friend. That's what I am. Yeah, you are. And and I can't, you know, look, I I can't thank you enough for for helping me, man. Because I, I I've said fifty thousand times, you know, when 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 I got that opportunity just because of a series of events that happened, and I get that chance to broadcast a handful of games one year, and then. You're my partner the next year in my first full year, getting a chance to broadcast games in the late 80s. And we travel around, and, and everywhere we went, you were Johnny Bench, and I'm just some guy trying to hang around and learn his way. And, and you were always so gracious and, and, um, and, and, and helpful and learned so much, and I'm just so indebted. Uh, and even no, Tommy, indebted you Tommy, come on the talent. air that's, for this. Well, that's, look, that's you, look, you, hey, you look, you know as well as I do, you can have all the talent in the world, you know? It's like when you brought up earlier about being the youngest kid in your family and then, and then about your youngest son. You know, I had a coach tell me a number of years ago, uh, said, look, you come line up all these kids that are trying out for any sport there is. The only question that I need to know without watching any of them play, he said, give me a show of hands who's the youngest kid in your family. He said, the second that hand goes up, I say, that's a guy I want on my team right now because they're <laughs> going to have something nobody else has. And, uh, and, and even now, here you are and, and doing this as we're trying to get this thing going. This has been fantastic. Our, our reception here, just looking at, at uh, YouTube, has just been unbelievable. They said, uh, the best guest by far of anybody we've had. People, uh, Jordan says, what a great down-to-earth guy. Uh, love Johnny Bench. Uh, great stuff. So, um, JB, thank you. God bless you. Always, always. Glad, uh, glad you got it. Glad you're off the bench. Get your ass off the bench for a while. Will you? <laughs> <laughs> My ass is off the bench. What? It, what? It, that, what was? Well, I can't remember verbatim what Bobby Knight said, but you know, when somebody's not right, you, you know, butt on the bench. Butt, butt meets bench. Bench stays on bench. You got to get your butt <laughs> off the bench if you want to do it. Then you're doing it, and I That's hope right. it. I hope it turns out well for you because I'm pulling for you. And you know, usually right now in today's society. You, I, I think you have to either rob a bank or shoot somebody or get caught in a drug sting to get your name in the papers anymore. So you make one little faux pas and you say something, you loose lips, sink ships, and these people, I don't know what the, you know, what their problem is, but they've got their own. I mean, if they open up their little attic and start looking through their, their closet, you're going to find a lot of people in what, and yet we've had other people get jobs uh, for a lot, you know, a lot worse <laughs> that did a whole bunch of lot of stuff. So that's what I don't say understand about society. You should have your chance. I'm for you. Uh, especially when I have to listen to this. Well, I listen on mute, so I don't know what the hell the games are about, but <laughs> I appreciate it. JB, all the best, my man. Take care of yourself and your boys. All right, man. Be good. Thanks. Thank you, sir. The, the great right. Johnny bench, the great Johnny bench. And that's the great Johnny bench on the field and off the field. Uh, I can't tell you what it was like traveling around with that guy um, when I was 20, what was I, 24, uh, something like that, traveling around the United States. God, that's hard to believe, man. It's 34 years ago. But, but, but traveling around the United States with that guy, I mean, you, you go rolling into New York City, it's like being with Mick Jagger. Um, you go rolling into Los Angeles and Dodger Stadium, and here comes Johnny Bench walking by, coat and tie, doing the broadcast. <laughs> he walked faster than any human being I've ever met. We called it the Johnny Bench Shuffle because when that guy, it was time to get somewhere, that guy could walk. And he was full steam ahead. I'm just trying to, you know, carry his bags behind him and was happy to be there to do it. And uh, we thank him for being here today. We're going to uh, tie a ribbon around.